exposed cement. There are two things you can do. Um, some people actually at the time of, of surgery say, oh, you should put like a composite filling there or afterwards you can, you can place a composite filling there. My problem with that is you always end up with like a ledge in that region, which is really difficult to get rid of. Um, but there is this phenomenon called creeping attachment, okay? And this happens, we don't really know why this happens. Um, still, they don't know why it happens. Um, and what it is, is when you, when you actually take a graft from the palate and you actually transplant it into another part of the mouth, in some people, that tissue continues to grow upwards until it reaches the CEJ. And this is called creeping attachment. And it does happen, um, but we're just not sure as to why it happens uh, and who it happens in. There's not, myself, I've found that people who have narrower arch tends to get, tend to get more creeping attachment. And it can happen for anything up to about a year um, after you've done your root coverage procedure. And it's great when it does happen. Um, but it's not that predictable. Recession around molars. Now, I don't do an awful lot of molars, but this was, a, this was um, the, fam, the cousin of a referring dentist. And she came to see me because she had extreme sensitivity from this um, recession around the molars. She was very young. She was only um, sort of 22. Um, and so we thought, OK, we'll do uh, soft tissue sort of surgery on her to try and improve that from a sensitivity viewpoint. So we took a graft, um, a connective tissue graft from the palate, and that was her after initial healing. So quite a nice improvement in that region, but she did get a little bit of relapse in that area. So these, these procedures don't always tend to be that predictable. So in this case, what we did was we'd had some improvement. So I wanted even more improvement we did in the second procedure. And this was after the second procedure. We've got a nice cuff of keratinized tissue around there. Her sensitivity is gone. She's really happy and easy to man maintain these areas. So it is possible to graft around um, molars as well, but they tend to be a little bit more technique sensitive and take more surgeries. Uh, as far as thickening the biotype is concerned, again, a thin biotype like this, we're thinking of doing some, um, we did a little phrenectomy here for it. An important thing that I didn't mention is a positive phrenal sign. This is a, a good indicator. So what you do is you pull the, phren the lower lip or the upper lip, and if you get blanching in the margin of this soft tissue, then there is a great likelihood that you will get an increase in the recession in that area. So for those reasons, you would actually do a, a phrenectomy. And the phrenectomy doesn't eliminate the frenum, but simply apically repositions the frenum. You can see it's still there. It's just not attached all the way up here. And it's decreased the pressure. And in this case, what we did was got a slight improvement in the soft, in the root coverage. But the, the reason why we did this is the patient had very facially placed teeth and wanted to facilitate their oral hygiene and thicken the biotype in that region. As far as this is a subject which is close to my heart, um, peri-implantitis, I see a lot of cases of peri-implantitis. Can everybody see which one is the peri-implantitis affected tooth or sight? Mm. So this was one of the first cases actually referred to me from somebody at Life Care, she's not at uh, Clarice. She referred me this lady who she didn't like the the colour of her soft tissue there. She said, oh, I went on holidays to Thailand about two years ago, and I decided that I would have a um, well. She didn't say I decided, but she, you know, she had a she had her front tooth removed and she had a impl immediate implant placed. And this is how she presented to me. This is the implant, it's like the longest implant in the world, and it's a 16 millimeter uh, noble biocare replacement. So it's not like a shonky implant system or anything, it's not like she was shortchanged. 
But, you know, there's so many things about this that are wrong. So this was the initial sort of work that we did to try and improve the soft tissues of this patient. And in those days, which was five years ago, I was a lot more conservative with my treatment of peri-implantitis than what I am now. My results much, much better now. So in this case, you know, I presented the options to this patient and I said, look, my feeling is that to get a good aesthetic result, you need to explant this implant, okay? And she was not really into that. Um, so she said, no, when I was, you know, try and have a go and see what you can do. And um, what happened was um, we removed this and we can see the threads completely out of bone, a lot of inflammatory tissue. And when, we, when, when we'd had soft tissue healing, you could see, you know, she's had an improvement in the inflammation. But an improvement in the aesthetics, I don't think that she has a positive outcome with that at all. She was unhappy with this black triangle. You know, she said the peri-implantitis much better though. Um, she was happy with the color. And then she disappeared for like two years. And she came back to see me a couple of years ago. Finally, I convinced her to explant the implant. So I removed the implant. And in this circumstance, we can see that this patient has very thin biotype. And I knew that she would need to have a, a block graft um, in this case. So before I was going to do my block graft, you can see I remove the um, frenum and we undertook a soft tissue graft to thicken her biotype and improve this area so that we can actually have enough space to do our block grafting. Um, this is the patient um, after she had had the new implant placed and well, the block graft done, the new implant placed, she'd gone through a series of temporaries and she had this. Because this is some of her palate, it always looks, the palate always has a little bit of rugi, but the improvement as compared to what she had is massive. Um, this is another case, one of the first cases I did. Um, this patient came to me, and can anybody give me an idea of, of what her chief complaint was? Who would say that the, the color of her gingiva? Well, actually, she presented with facial pain. So I'm in terrible pain, and I don't know what it is. It seems to be coming from the front of my mouth and going all the way into my head. And so we had a look, and you know, she had had this implant placed, and we couldn't really see anything wrong with the implant at all. It was well integrated. The gingiva was fine about it. She had had, you know, somebody who I think was partially blind when they did the um, <laughs> apisectomy on the, on the previous tooth. This was a case from England. Um, and so she'd had this horrible amalgam tattoo. So what we decided we'd do was um, an onlay graft. And so in this specific case, we decided, okay, there was quite a lot of, of, um, of um, change in color in that region. What happens with amalgam tattoos is that the amalgam um, is actually taken up by fixed macrophages within the um, soft tissue and then just as the soft tissue remodels these, these um, pieces of amalgam become completely fixed into that area and you can never get rid of them. And what we had to do was we took a little template. In these days, I was doing templates, okay? So this is one of the teaching cases that I, I was doing. Um, so I, I did a little template, and I thought it looked nice for the presentation as well. Um, and then this is me having removed some of the epithelium in this case. And you can see how deep the amalgam, actually, the tattoo goes. We took quite a thick part from um, her palate. Um, and sutured it in place. And these were the little, I used to use little ophthalmic sutures in those, in those days. They were really nice with these on, on lay graphs. I can't get hold of them here. Um, but you can see that here we want to change the color of this um, epithelium very much. We're not going to want to do something like a connective tissue graft because it's not gonna give us the same result. So this was her initially after healing. I was very, very happy with that. And this was her, an improvement, but it wasn't just right for me, you know? I was like, still looks a bit ugly, actually. 
So this gray through, I didn't like it at all. So I thought, I said to her, okay, I think we need to do another procedure now. So we're going to do a combination of another onlay graft. And then after that, we'll do a little connective tissue graft as well. And really just try and get rid of all these layers of, of, um, of amalgam. One of the problems with doing this number of surgery is the amount of scar tissue that you get formed. So you really need to pick and choose when you're going to be doing these cases. And you can see that, you know, the amount of rugi that are left behind here as well. So this was her after we had done the second surgery, we'd done some gingival plasty as well. I couldn't, there was no point in getting rid of this. And this was her finished result, which I was very happy with. And one of the nicest things was, was when she finished her treatment, which took about two years to complete, um, I asked her how her pain was. And she said, yeah, it's completely fine now. So I think her lack of smiling was just giving her a headache all the time. So that really improved her health. Um, this was a case that was referred to me here um, for recession around an implant. So the patient said, you know, I had an implant placed five years ago and I was brushing my teeth the other day and just all of a sudden I felt a pain here and this happened. Okay. So, um, this is how she presented, um, decided to do a soft tissue, you can see quite a th thick connective tissue graft there, um, modified Langer and Langer flap technique, quite a generous flap technique there. Um, this was her initially after the, sur uh, this was her after the second surgery actually, you can see I did a, um, another graft there for her. So basically she was left with some degree of recession after the first surgery and then we simply did a semi-lunar flap here which just apically positioned that and that was her at the end and I think this is five year follow-up because she's one of the first cases that I did at, at the practice so it's quite nice because we have a five year follow-up on her. Really great results, managed to keep the implant um, crown without her having to replace it. And one of the problems with that case and the reason why she developed all that recession was the fact that, you know, the implant was quite facially placed. And so she was facially placed against someone who had a, a highly scalloped, thin gingival biotype. So the pr likelihood of having recession was quite great. Um, this is another case that was referred to me. Um, and this is actually, um, she, she came, she had an implant which was placed in England. She came to see me um, after being referred by somebody in England um, for this recession around her implant. And she actually said to me that she had oral candidiasis. And it, when she came to see me, she had red margin around her, er, around her gums, which stretched from this tooth to this tooth. And it was fiery red. This is actually an improvement on what it was. I haven't got the very first pictures. Um, and so when she came in to see me and she said, oh, you know, I've got this candida and this is oral thrush. And, you know, she was so convinced that she had it, um, that she was actually convincing me as well, you know. And, and then I just thought, hang on a minute, Manas, you know, don't jump to conclusions. Let's, let's have a look at this. And what it was, was she had had a very poor fitting implant crown that was made. And the first thing that I did, um, she was, yeah, because she was um, referred from England, the first thing I did was, was say to her, look, I'm not going to do any treatment for you, yeah? She'd already had somebody else um, do a peri-implant surgery on her before she came to see me. And I said, I'm not doing any more surgery for you. You need to go and see a prosthodontist, okay? So go and see Bob. I sent her, um, I phoned up Bob. I said, you have to see her like within the next week, yeah? because um, I'm convinced that this problem here is being contributed to by the crown. And so please do not underestimate the effect of, you know, the prosthesis on the soft tissues. And I think that's one thing that people do with peri-implant problems. They think, oh my God, it's a surgical problem when it's actually interrelated with a prosthetic problem. And she had a very poorly fitting crown. This was a very nice, provisional crown that was made by Bob. So he remade the crown and then I started to do soft tissue work around it. This was the first surgery that we did. 
Implants are not like teeth, so trying to manipulate soft tissues around implants is actually, um, you can't push the boundaries of soft tissue work like you can with teeth. Because teeth have periodontal ligaments, you can get blood supply from over the top of the area. In implants, you've got scar tissue in here, you've got an avascular area underneath, so you have to be, go very slowly with your with your um, soft tissue work. So this was the initial surgery that we did. We did have to raise a flap because she had inflammatory tissue up there. And that was her initial healing. Again, like, I'm so happy when I see that because I know that this is soft tissue that's taken. This was her at around about, um, about eight weeks afterwards. And you know, I was pretty happy with that, but I um, wanted to improve this even more so we, did a second stage um, soft tissue graft procedure and that healed up really well. And this is her with still in the provisional, still in the provisional, but this was her at approximately one year. So I haven't got, she hasn't been back to see, yeah, Bob's provisionals are amazing, aren't they? Mm. <laughs> um, and so this was her, um, she's going to have the, the permanent one um, done soon, so um, you know it's, it's a case that you can achieve a lot around implants as far as soft tissue is concerned. And that's her again. Um, so this is another case that was referred to me for peri-implantitis around these crowns. Uh, the crowns were the implants were placed within in South Africa. They're quite facially placed. There's cement overs, and can you see this? Yep, this is cement. So, of course, the first thing that we did in that case was um, remove, remove the cement. The next thing that she wanted to do, I did coronally reposition the tissues, but in these circumstances, they never stay for very long. So now what we're up to is the next stage that we're doing is I did another separate connective tissue graft in this region, and we've had, she's had an improvement, but it is minimal. This was a case that was referred to me for this. This is an implant here, and the implants is slightly placed, very slightly, to the distal. And uh, you can see that that implant is just slightly distally inclined. And this poor woman has a diastema you could drive a train through, you know? So um, this was what she was referred to me for, OK? So recreating this papilla and harmonizing it and improving it. So this was her when she smiled. Of course, you know, she didn't have a low smile line, you know? Um, and it was a very healthy implant, and to try and improve the emergence of that, I mean, she would just, if you would try to make these bigger, she'd end up with two refrigerator doors in her front <laughs> mouth. Um, so this, was what we, this is what we did. First of all, we took, we took soft tissue from the tuberosity in this region because we want it to maintain some of its bulk, um, graft it into position. This was after the first, um, this was how she started. This was after the first surgery. This was after the second surgery. Um, it's just a bit of suturing, that's the tuberosity there, that was the healing, and this is her um, now finally reconstructed. So what we did was we didn't, the previous soft tissue was one side down here, one side up there. We managed to even it out and thicken it up with a reasonably acceptable um, aesthetic result after, afterwards. Um, has everybody heard of mucograft? So mucograft is basically like Bioguide but it's actually formulated in a different way. So initially when mucograft came out, um, they asked for us to do some work on recession. Um, so a couple of surgeries in WA were asked to do the beta testing of it, and my surgery was one. So it's a bilayer membrane, and you've got a dense layer at the top, which is like Bioguide, and then you've got this spongy layer, which you know, cells are meant to grow in. And one of the nice things about it was meant to replace taking soft tissue. Um, and um, these are some of the cases that I used it on. This was the most, one of the most unhappiest patients. You know, this was her smiling, yeah? <laughs> um, and yeah, she came for some implants, and she had to have you know, a ridge splitting um, surgery. This was her after we had done the ridge split surgery. She had these, um, she had these canines, which had some recession around them. Um, the implant bridge was placed by the prosthodontist. And even though this was her smile, um, 
Uh, well, the thing that bothered her was this little bit of recession next to the implant. So this type of recession, you can be fooled into thinking that this actually is a class one um, or a class two recession. It's actually a class three recession because the implants around here and the bone levels slightly reduced. Um, yeah, this is her smiling, you see? Lovely lady. Um, and um, this was the area of recession. It was about three millimeters, very wide recession. We took the piece of muca graft, um, sutured it in position using a tunneling technique, and that was her afterwards. We got an improvement in the soft tissue. One of the nicest things was that she, you know, the amount of pain that you get with this type of procedure is really minimal because there's no donor site. Um, and there, you see? That was her after the soft tissue, yeah. Um, this is another site where um, you use muca graft, um, an improvement, but in my experience in both of these sites, you know, if I was to use autogenous tissue, apart from the pain side of things, autogenous tissue would give you a much more predictable result. Um, this is another case of mucograft being re um, used around <coughs> recession defects, an improvement, but not, not fabulous. Um, one of the things that we noticed um, and this was a consensus meeting that we had of all the users of mucograph in New Zealand and Australia that we did in 2012. And we found that actually for recession and root coverage, it's not a very predictable mater you material. You have to suture it a lot. So you've got to be happy with suturing. Um, one of the things that you've probably heard of now is called something called mucograft socket seal. So when you're using a ridge preservation procedure, they've got these little dots of mucograft, exactly the same stuff that you suture in, and it gives you keratinized tissue. So it's quite nice to do if you're going to do a delayed approach to implants or if you're going to actually extract a tooth and then maybe, you know, the patient's going to have a pontic there or you want to, uh, they don't, they're not sure if they want to have any um, implants in um, it's quite a nice thing to do for them because it gives them keratinized tissue and also preserves their ridge. So this is, I took um, one piece of mucograft, cut it in two and sutured it here in position. And here we can see that we've got a nice cuff of keratinized tissue around these lower implants. I think this is a case that I did for Alan, Alan Quan, who's, who had a car, car breakdown. Break yeah. <laughs> um, and there's a little bit of his, his, histology on it. So, first of all, um, in conclusion, um, I think that things that you need to take away from today is that, you know, mucogingival problems affect um, a range of groups of people and genders, and that um, there are, it is a multifactorial problem, um, that root coverage procedures, when you respect the classification and you respect the biology are very predictable procedures um, and that um, there are an increase, in my experience, there are an increase of soft tissue problems which are associated with implant placement and um, there are, nowadays there are a lot that we can do around implants to um, both treat sort of aesthetic problems which have occurred with implant placement um, and also um, functional problems. So on that note, um, I always do like things that think outside the box. Um, and um, there are some new materials which are coming out um, to, increase, um, to increase the thickness of soft tissues. Um, so... Um, <coughs> I want you to um, keep aware of that. Um, I hope you enjoyed this evening. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Um, these are my contact details. Please send me an email if you want to have any questions answered. I usually, as Justin said, I usually get back um, within 24 hours um, to questions, um, especially from this email, because I can access that at home. Um, do you have any questions? <laughs>